أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم أكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وسهل أخلاقنا بالحلم وجعلنا مما يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه اللهم آمين uh, We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for uh, bringing us here to uh, study the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that it was uh, revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, alhamdulillah you know I have had the opportunity to I think will work with most of you in terms of uh, the Quran so um, inshallah azza wa jal uh, just very quickly before we start some, some details uh, maybe the best thing is to go through just structure of the of what we're going to be doing here inshallah Uh, so inshallah what we'll try to do here is go through the details of the recitation of the Quran with the riwayah or the narration of or the recitation of Hafs an Asim uh, and inshallah we're going to show a little bit of the detail of the lineage that actually connects this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, in, term, in terms of uh, references further come on inshallah in terms of references, there are, mashallah, numerous references on this. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has so much attention. There is this book by Atiyah Qabil Nasr, Ghayat al murid fi ilm al-Tajweed, Al-Budur al-Zahira, fi al-Qira'at al-Ashr al-Mutawatira. Ah, bismillah. Um, we have Hadiyat al-Mustafid fi Ahkam al-Tajweed. We have Al-Burhan fi Tajweed al-Quran. And there is actually um, a, a very nice um, online, it's in Arabic for uh, Dr. Sheikh uh, Ayman al Sweed, who's who has the shortest narration to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi in a, one of the shortest narrations to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi in terms of connection to uh, in terms of recitation. So he has over 100 kind of uh, series, uh, kind of um, sessions of a series of Ahkam al Tajweed. So that, that was one of the main sources that I went into. It so happens that one of the best books for Tajweed is actually this one in English. It's called Tajweed Rules of the Quran and that's kind of the main reference of what we'll be using here. This is the book that was sent to you in the email. So I'll pass it around for you to see. It's actually divided into the three parts that we'll talk about here, which is the articulation, which is the makharij, the articulation of how the sounds actually are articulated, the attributes of the alphabets. So part one is the, uh, is the articulations, part two is the alphabets, and part three is when to stop and when to start in the Quran. And we'll see how each one of them is actually important. So I'll pass this around. If you are interested in this, we can order, um, order it for you, or you can just get it from Jarir. You can order it online. I want to mention to you that a lot of the slides that you will see are actually based on this along with Ayman al-Suwaid. And Ayman al-Suwaid actually put at the introduction of this book, Ayman al-Suwaid uh, gave actually an intro saying that he approves this book. So which is, so this is a very good reference for, for English speakers um, to, to use for Tajweed, inshallah. Um, I have my, my number there, inshallah, in case uh, one of the things we'll try to do is we'll go through this here on a weekly basis, but then we'll, if you need help, you can always, inshallah, contact me too during the week for quick reviews, inshallah. Our meetings are going to be scheduled for the most part 8 to 10 every Saturday. In the event that we need to change the schedule for whatever reason, we can always schedule it here within ourselves. So we'll keep it that way, inshallah. Attendance is mandatory. <laughs> I'm going to go into my statistical mode of teaching now. Uh, attendance is mandatory for the purpose to have continuity. Because there will, we can't, in this topic here, we build on every topic. And so, in fact, at the beginning, it's a, it's a little bit difficult because when you just address one letter or two or three letters and then don't have kind of an idea about the rest, uh, it's, it's actually incomplete. So what we would like to do is to have actually continuity be Azzawajal. So as much as possible, I mean, if you have to miss, you have to miss, but as much as possible, we'd like to have it, inshallah, uh, continuous. Any questions in terms of structure? In terms of topics, the details, this is the actual topics. 
it's inshallah designed to, to be approximately um, uh, about six months inshallah. So today, uh, if Allah gives us the ability, we'll go through the introduction, the uh, oral and nasal cavity uh, letters, and the letters of the throat, and then we'll go through the letters of the tongue, and there are different aspects of it, and then let, uh, letters of the nasal passage, and so on. So this is, I'll, I'll actually send you this. I wanted to print this, but I really didn't know how many people will show up. And also just to be kind of, to save paper. <laughs> I don't want to just print and then uh, may, maybe not use it or so. But inshallah, I can email you these details. Any questions before we start? Tfadal. I have a question. Um, is it, if the person only open to Muslim, does it mean that they can't read Arabic? Or is it like Very good question. The way we have it right now, yes. And, and it's really for the purpose that we, uh, what I intend, inshallah, Azzawajal Arad, this internally, is actually to have five brothers and five sisters. So, ha so far we have, alhamdulillah, four. But uh, at least five brothers and five sisters minimum to actually be able to teach after this. So uh, it, to, to me, it's very important that mass members are actually equipped with the ability to read the Quran, as we'll see the hukm of it in a little bit. But also in addition to just knowing the, the hukm, but actually to be able to teach this to others. Each one of us are, are either usra leader or is in an usra or soon potentially to be leading an usra. We should be having the minimum ability to correct our usra members or so in their recitations. So inshallah, but, but I, ideally in actually being able to teach this in the masajid. So we should be equipped inshallah by the end of the course to be able to actually teach this and not just be able to uh, recite it. Tab, any other questions? If you see any person that has, you know, we need really just a great potential to be added. I mean, it's, there is, by, by all means, I just give me the specific person. We can just specifically invite them. Uh, but I actually, I love to have this to be a small number and not a big number in terms of attendees so that we can actually do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so the bigger the number, the more difficult it becomes to manage. Uh, yeah. Are you going to be about closing it off? Like, this is the first class if people come in second or, you know? No, what, uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, there are, there are some people they won't be able to attend regularly, and I realize that there are some that are not able to make it, and they already told me they're not going to be able to make the first session. But what I would probably see is in about three to four sessions from now, I'm going to need see the regular people. And on those is going to be the main focus. So that's what I mean by mandatory. There, uh, whoever attends from the USRA members for a given session, they will learn something. But I wouldn't be spending much of the time with them. So I'm going to see, I'm going to see a pattern of four to five sessions. I'm going to see who are the regular people. And on those is going to be the main focus in terms of one-on-one -on -one assistance, inshallah. Any questions? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So inshallah, the... Uh, First of all, the chain of narration of Hafs and Asim. You know, um, Hafs, uh, the, uh, many times when we hear about these uh, recitations, there are many of these Qurra. Um, we never, subhanAllah, for some reason, we never think that this is all linked into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and Sheikh Uthman, my, my teacher actually regularly reminds me of this, and he says, just remember always that the words that we're, we're trying to read and recite is, is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave to Jibreel. And we're gonna go through the details of how this is actually done, because that's, that's very important to understand, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave these words to Jibreel, and Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the, through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in terms of the narration of Hafs an Asim, there were a number of the Sahaba, radhuanallahi alayhim, that actually recited this specific type of recitation. Uthman ibn Affan, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zayd ibn Abi Thabit, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and Ubayy ibn Ka'b. And these, eventually, the, the Abdul Rahman, Abu Abdullah Habib al-Sulami, actually recited from, uh, from, from the narration that they have actually recited, and then Asim ibn Abu Nujud, and then Hafs ibn Sulaiman ibn 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 al Mughira ibn al Asadi al Kufi, and and so what for us most important thing to remember is that this is you know a connection. So inshallah, as we see in a little bit, there are a series of. Bear with me, Allah. I'm a little bit perspiring here. This is my natural thing. And then this is the, the Quran, so I feel it, mashallah. طيب. In terms of the history, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran mentioned, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he has 
revealed these uh, the the dhikr, the 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 reminder, and that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the guardian of it. Now, this Subhanallah, you know, the process it is really phenomenal, amazing process by which today we have the Quran amongst us, and we really kind of maybe some of us do not know the details of how it got to us. But the process by which these words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he chose to speak to us actually got to us the very first revelation of the Quran and you would notice that I'm going through this because I don't want us to think of for us to sit here and just be able to read Quran in terms of words. We are here, uh, as my teachers very frequently remind me, that you are here for a purpose. You will see that the Quran, the way it got to us here through this process, that it came from a group to a group to a group to a group, and somehow you and I, after 1400 years later, we're sitting in helping hands um, through this process and trying to maintain that those words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually said from the, from the day one. This was in Allah al-Mahfud. So what was, in, what was written there, we're actually, the same words we're actually trying to study and trying to maintain. So we're here not to just properly uh, say words, but to maintain the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said that we will be guardians of it. You and I happen to be part of that process. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a reason has put us in this, in this position. So you and I are here for a mission. And so we're here to understand first how it got to us so that when we go through this, you know, and we get through maybe some lazy moments or so, we're constantly reminded that we are here for a purpose and not just to learn how to say qaf and kaf and so on. But a bigger mission of maintaining being a guardian of the Quran and Allah using us for that purpose. That's the biggest, the bigger thing of what we're trying to do here. The very first revelation of the Quran actually took place on Laylatul Qadr. The very first one. And this is from al lawh al-Mahfuz. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, actually, when he created this, this uh, world, um, put in Allah al-Mahfuz everything in it, including the words that we see in the Quran. We're actually in Allah al-Mahfuz. This is in the seventh heaven. And then on Laylat al-Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this uh, through Jibreel, through, um, to Jibreel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Jibreel, take these words from Allah al-Mahfuz and give it to al-Safara, al-Kiram al-Barara. And these are angels. Angels that were designed to take these words of the Quran from Allah al-Mahfuz and actually put it into Bayt al-Izzah, the first heaven, or what we call Al-Bayt al-Ma'mur. Al-Bayt al-Ma'mur is in the first heaven. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said actually, وَبِالْحَقِّ أَنزَلْنَاهُ وَبِالْحَقِّ نَزَلْ وَبِالْحَقِّ أَنزَلْنَاهُ is that first part. When it came from the seventh heaven to the first heaven. This is from Angel Jibreel giving it to the Malaika and the Malaika actually now putting it in the first heaven, into Bayt al-Izzah. That's the very first revelation of the Quran on that Laylatul Qadr. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr, according to the majority of our scholars, is on this first revelation, when it came from the seventh heaven to the first heaven. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. Up until this stage, it was only preserved in these three places. That's it. Allah al-Mahfub, where originally it's still there, in the heart of Jibreel, and then this Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur, where the angels, Safarat Al-Kiram Al-Barara, these Malaika, that were just their purpose was simply to actually deliver the Quran from al al Mahfuz to Bayt Al-Izzah, or Bayt Al-Ma'mur. This was the very first revelation that took place. In the second revelation, this, this is the time during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi time, in 23 years, where the Quran was actually uh, preserved by given to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam through Jibreel alayhi salam over these and, and then over these huffad and the companions that 20, those 23 years of continuous revelation that's wa bilhaq anzalnahu the first part wa bilhaq nazal wa bilhaq nazal the second part is this one here the second revelation this is the 23 years that actually it took place for the most part during this process, and this is very critical for us to understand, if I lose any one of you, I don't want you to wait until the end, stop me, inshallah. For the most part during this process, the process of actually preserving the Quran was through memorization, for the most part. It was documented. There were some Sahaba, as you will see the names in a little bit, that were actually meant to actually write. 
to actually document the Quran. So when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to hear it from Jibreel Alayhi Salam, Jibreel uh, and, and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would actually read it to, to the, uh, or, or recite it to the, uh, to the uh, companions. The companions would write. When they write, before they go and actually give it to the rest of the companions, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would ask them, recite it to me back. Whatever you've written, say it to me. And, and, and the Prophet Sallallahu would listen and approve, and then they will actually go and disseminate this, this, uh, this Quran to the, to, to, the, to the people. And so where was it documented? It was documented on bones, wood, uh, paper, w whatever, leaves, and, and all sorts of things that were uh, possible to just document. The companions, the, 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 the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi during this time, would receive a verse, a surah or so. When another one comes, he would tell them that this would go after another, after another surah. And, this, and so even though during this process, and this is very important to know, there was no one book from cover to cover where all the Quran was put from cover to cover. It was known, it was memorized as a sequence in order. So the Prophet ﷺ told them what the order is. But it was never put in terms of a book. But they knew it. They knew it because when the Prophet ﷺ, for example, Surah Al-Imran was revealed in, in so many different phases. Al-Baqarah in so many different parts of these 23 years. And yet, when the Prophet ﷺ would recite Surah Al-Baqarah in that narration when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud would listen to him, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was in, in, in Masjid al-Nabawi and uh, just happened to show up in the Masjid and the Prophet ﷺ was making salah and the Prophet ﷺ started with Surah Al-Baqarah and then continued Surah Al-Imran and then he made uh, you know, the, the, uh, the rak'ah uh, that long so Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was listening to the entire Surah Al-Baqarah in the order that we know it today so this, the sequence of the verses, how they came one after, this was preserved in the days of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi So it was not in what we call a book form, but it was known through majority of, of memorization, and it was documented, it was written, but it was not put cover to cover. That is during this, this uh, phase. So at this time, if somebody would say, was there a standard book called the Quran? Not in terms of a book, but in terms of content, yes. In terms of order, yes. In terms of surah to surah, ayah to ayah, all of this, absolutely. It was clearly documented. There were many of the Sahaba, Radwanullahi alayhim, that actually have, have memorized the Quran cover to cover, meaning in terms of that order. The first comp compilation of the Qur'an that took place, compilation referring to putting it in terms of a book. The f this occurred in the time of the Khalifa Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And the reason this happened is because when the Prophet wasallam died, a number of people actually left Islam. A number of people. And during this time, Khalid ibn al-Walid, uh, and, and, and some of them, you know, they became followers of of Al-Aswad Al-Ansi and, uh, uh, and as, as well as Musaylam Al-Kadhab. These people, the false prophets that they claim to be prophets, some followed them. And, and this was a concern. And so uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, sent a huge number of the Sahaba to actually fight uh, these people. And this, this uh, probably have, some of you have heard about the Battle of Yamama. In the Battle of Yamama, a large number of the Huffad actually died, were killed during this period. This was a concern. Abu Bakr, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab had kind of an insight to this and said, you know what, if in one battle we're losing this many of the Sahaba who are memorizers of the Quran, how about down the line, how many in, in, in X number of years, what would happen? So he actually suggested to the Prophet to, to uh, uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq to actually compile the Quran in terms of a book. And the whole purpose here was just to use it as a reference. He, 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 he just said, you know, let's put it in one book and then we'll do whatever we do with it. But let's just put everything in one book so that in case everybody dies, we at least have the book. Abu, uh, this was very difficult on Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, to him, he said, I cannot do something that the Prophet ﷺ never did. And he just wanted to stick to the process by which everything has been set before the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Yet Umar ibn Khattab kept on emphasizing this to him tremendously. And, and at one point, they actually, uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, felt comfortable with this. And he said, let's go ahead and do this. 
and they actually decided to compile the book and the person they selected for this was Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anh. remember this name this name is among the greatest of the Sahaba radiallahu alayhim you know we remember many times Abu Bakr and Umar and of course these are the great ones but we forget some of the key significant Sahaba radiallahu alayhim that played a significant role for you and me to reach for, uh, for us to, re to receive this deen Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anh the Prophet sallallahu wasallam used to receive, you know, the, the Quran re reviewed every year during, uh, you know, once. Jibreel would come in, whatever has been revealed until that point, he would review in that order. So uh, the Prophet sallallahu wasallam would just re recite everything that he knows until that point. And then whatever has come the next year, all of that. And then what, all of that. And, and kept on adding it. Zayd ibn Thabit عنه, was the Sahabi that the Prophet ﷺ selected and used to just always go ahead and tell him. He was, he was good in writing, he was very good in terms of memory, memorization, very, very good. And so the Prophet ﷺ, you know, uh, uh, because he selected him for that purpose, not only that, not that, not, not only every time a review would happen that the Prophet ﷺ would, would choose Zayd, the very last year when the Prophet ﷺ uh, died والسلام, he actually Jibreel والسلام, came and, and told him to recite it twice to the Prophet والسلام, the whole Quran the whole thing and you and I at this you think we think it's just you know we say this and it seems light we will see in a little bit when the Quran was revealed it was not just revealed in one type of uh, uh, dialect it was sent in seven different dialects there was the dialect of Quraysh, the dialect of the, the people in, 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 in different parts of, of, of Arabia. Seven dialects, not just that. Within each dialect, there were different recitations, qira'at. The Prophet وسلم, would review not just, the, not just Quraysh's uh, dialect, but all the different dialects, and within each dialect, the different recitations. <laughs> This was a very huge thing. Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu was selected by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he would actually go and, and review whatever was said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam during that last one, recited with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had to approve what Zayd actually has memorized. You see, Zayd radiallahu anhu at least was a little bit literate. I mean, he could read at, you know, some, and it's easier. And once you write things, you tend to remember. Right, I mean, the Prophet ﷺ was not able to, to that's why, you know, to, to read and write, of course. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said uh, um, in the Quran, سَنُقْرِئُكَ uh, فَلَا تَنْسَى Because in his ability as a human, it's very difficult for him to keep all of that. And what kind of memory would, would but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, سَنُقْرِئُكَ We will make you read and we will make you uh, not, not forget. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ was, was able to, to maintain the, 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 the uh, memory. But that's why, you remember this name Zayd. When Umar ibn al-Khattab convinced Abu Bakr al-Siddiq with this, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, I want one of the Sahabi that the Prophet ﷺ re repeatedly kept on drilling that Quran in him. He selected Zayd ibn Thabit. And that's why Zayd ibn Thabit, the, uh, he, was, he was the one that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and, and Zayd ibn Thabit requested. Whoever has any kind of thing written uh, that the Quran is written on, on a wood, on leaves, on whatever it is, bring it to me. And out of that, he compiled the, what we call the copy of Abu Bakr, Mus'haf Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Yes. Good. The very first one here, it was, it was just Zayd ibn Thabit on the very first one. The very first but copy. When he collected those pieces, like they were written by different people? Oh, yes. Things? Yeah, this was. No, this was. The, the writings were throughout and it was announced everywhere. Where there is any Quran, bring it. Because we're actually compiling all of that. And it's, it was all just, you know, just to make sure that there is a reference book. That's all. But Zayd ibn Thabit would actually document everything that was. So whoever claims and says, I have something. So the, when they come and they say, I have something, Zayd ibn Thabit would say, okay, recite it to me. 
and you have to have a witness that it was actually a revelation. And so Zayd ibn Thabit would actually write, and he has already memorized it. So it was easy to actually verify, but he would compile that. So keep in mind, the copy of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was the, with the seven dialects. Okay, the copy of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was with the, all the seven dialects. Everything that's actually there was, was actually put in the, uh, in the, with, the, with, the uh, in, uh, with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. When Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu died, uh, Umar ibn Khattab, of course, uh, took over. And when, when Umar ibn Khattab uh, died, this was handed over to Hafsa. Hafsa, the, the, the daughter of, of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And it remained with her during this, in, uh, you know, after the death of Abu Bakr, uh, Abu Bakr and of course uh, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Okay. So far, we're okay? This, this series of things. And then now comes the second compilation of the Quran. What happened during this period is Umar, uh, Uthman ibn Affan uh, was the Khalifa. And during his time, what happened is there was, you know, uh, Islam spread. Islam spread to uh, Azerbaijan, to different parts of, you know, the Soviet and, and Europe and different parts of the, of, the, of the world. And when Islam spread during the, in, in those times, in one of those, uh, uh, you know, the Sahaba, of course, went into these battles, spread themselves in, in different parts of the world. In one of those battles, uh, the, the, when, when they got to the actual, uh, after the, the, the battle itself, and people were just reciting different Quran, if you will. Uh, some of them were saying, you know, you're reading something that it just sounds, we've never heard this. And others were, and, and you know, we're talking about some people that have been just, just barely entered Islam and they just received some, and so they don't have, if you will, the tarbiyah. They, they don't know that maybe there are different dialects. They don't, one of the Sahaba that was there, and remember this name, uh, Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman was, was a Sahabi, subhanAllah, even in the days of the Prophet Sallallahu he used to say, the Sahaba used to ask questions of the good things from the Prophet Sallallahu In other words, what are the good things that we can do? And Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman used to say, but I used to ask the things that are negative, the bad things, so that I don't go into them. He was always kind of concerned about potential things that could go wrong. That was Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. So when he saw this, and he saw that uh, some of the Muslims are actually almost getting into a fight, all because each one of them believes that his version is the most correct and the other one is wrong. Because of this, there, uh, because of this concern, he actually wrote to Uthman ibn Affan. And he said, Uthman, you, you need to, radiallahu anh, you need to, uh, you, you need to capture this ummah before it actually starts to fight each other. And all of this because of the Quran. So he actually talked to Uthman ibn, and Uthman ibn Affan again chose the Sahabi Zayd ibn Thabit again. Because he wrote, he was, you know, he got the revelation from, Abu, from the Prophet Sallallahu directly. He wrote that very first copy that has been with, that, that is now with Hafsa radiallahu anha. Um, and so he selected at this point here in the second compilation, Zayd ibn Thabit actually selected as Zubair Abdullah ibn Zubair, Sa'id ibn, uh, Sa'id ibn al-As, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Haritha, and, and these three, these are three Qurayshiyin, these are from Quraysh. Zayd ibn Thabit is al-Ansari, they call him, Zayd ibn Thabit al-Ansari, he's from al-Ansari, he's Madani. So, these are the Qurayshiyin. So, Uthman ibn Affan told him, what I want you to do, is I want you to actually make copies of the Quran that is with, with, at the, with, the, with, with Hafs. But that copy that you have there, because there are so many different dialects, what I want you to do is, if there is any kind of, if whatever you are reciting matches with the Qurashin, the dialect of Quraysh, you just write everything because there is a match. If there is any mismatch, keep the Quraysh dialect. So in essence, everything that's on it will be the Quraysh dialect. Because if there is an agreement, then the Quraysh is still there. If there is a disagreement, then the Quraysh would be, the dialect will be prevailing. And so in essence, the Quraysh dialect was favored by, by him. And primarily because it was revealed, for the most part, majority of the people that received it were the Quraysh, that's where the, 
uh, Quran was, was, was revealed and, and also it was the most popular because people would go into Hajj and would understand the dialect of Quraysh but in other, the other dialects would be sometimes difficult to be understood but the Quraysh was understood by all and so it was selected to be the one and so what is the difference between the Mus'haf of Uthman and the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq the difference between them is the Mus'haf of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq has the seven dialects and the Mus'haf of Uthman has this one dialect, the dialect of, uh, yes. When you say yes. seven dialects, that means were there like seven different volumes? No, it's actually one, it's one Quran, mm -hmm. but there are few words would actually, would be different. So for example, in some areas, um, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Qari'a says, Al-Qari'atum Al-Qari'a wa ma'adraka ma Al-Qari'a uh, uh, is actually uh, wool or uh, yeah, wool. Um, in, in other dialects, they don't know what ihn is. So in other dialects, it actually would say kasuf al There's another dialect that actually says kasuf. Totally different word. It's not even, so there are, if you would add them by the way, and you know, when we talk about these, it, it, we're not talking about seven versions as, you know, totally. No, if you were to add them, there were about 20 to 30 words differences throughout the Quran as a whole. So we're not talking about, you know, but keep in mind, each one of those had a series or a, a group of Sahaba that have memorized it in that given dialect. So that was approved and this was approved and so on. So all of these were approved by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so those are the differences. When Uthman ibn Affan saw that there is, you know, the purpose of, and he, this is his insight, you know, some, some would actually say, why would Uthman ibn Affan delete some of these words that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala was revealed? This is what you would hear from, you know, some of the Christian channels and so on. Uthman ibn Affan had an insight to this and he, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought those dialects so that people would understand what is revealed. And that purpose has been fulfilled. And now everybody understands the, the recitation of Quraysh. And everybody has approved it. So why, there is no point of having, he saw that the, the fight that potentially could occur with many versions would be a more, may, more harm than just sticking to just then, then removing some of these words. This is his insight. This is fiqh al-muhazana. How to balance the understanding. And that was his insight to this. And subhanAllah, over time, now we realize how much insight he had to this. Alhamdulillah, that now today we're dealing with just one. I mean, if at their time they were having issues, imagine us, we'd have some serious issues with these today. Yes. Yes, Yeah, it is. Everywhere. Everywhere today, everywhere, and what we see is within that harf Quraysh, there are different, there are few words that you would do tafkhim, tarqiq, you know, and, and the different attributes of the letters. And so those differences, different areas in, in Arabia would have different ways of reciting some letters, just like you'd have, you know, the British accent and the English accent. That's and the why, I mean, we hear sometimes in the North Africa they say it like. Very good. Those are the qira'at, the different recitations within the Quraysh dialect. Zakallah khair. Very good. So nafa' in all of these, these different, there are seven mutawatir, seven, and, and three ahad, total of ten qira'at that are out there. These are the different recitations within the Quraysh dialect. So you can imagine with me now, there were seven different dialects, Within each dialect, there were so many different recitations. You can imagine, how did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam keep all of that? سَنُقْرِئُكَ فَلَا تَنْسَى That has a lot of weight to it. Has a lot of weight. How does, how, and you can see how what the Sahaba, رضوان الله عليهم, what they went through to actually keep that and maintain that. And, and they would actually, even though a lot of them were illiterate, there were some literates among uh, being able to write, but they were able to document all of that. But through memory, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them at that time, memory was just their thing. You know, they used to uh, uh, do poetry and all of that. So they used to memorize a lot of things. So it was the thing for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equipped them. Allah chose them for a reason. But memory was the main thing. But eventually, knowing with Islam spreading, 
and the, the, the all, not all of them are at the level of the Sahaba in understanding differences when things started to spread Uthman ibn Affan had an insight of saying you know what it's more beneficial to just keep one version and that is a Quraysh that everybody understands will just keep that in maintenance so that's how today what we have here is this Qurayshi uh, uh, compilation of the of the Quran any questions do you have any questions before we proceed yes The, the copy? No, all, all of that, all of that, but after it's, yeah, what, uh, very good question actually. Yeah, after Abu Bakr, uh, Uthman ibn Affan uh, ordered that copy to be actually put, they actually made several copies of that, and they actually spread it in, in everywhere. And so what um, uh, Uthman ibn Affan gave is very, very clear instruction. And by the way, I'm just going too fast on this, because that's not really the idea is not to go through the detail. If you look at the criteria of what Zayd ibn Thabit actually have put, this is like research criteria, criteria of how they would approve anybody bringing anything and then saying that this is the Quran, very, very clear criteria. And actually I happened to give a dars on this in Masjid of Redlands because they wanted something like this before. But very kind of detailed criteria of, of, of what to accept and what not to accept. But once that is compiled, what he said is the following, I want these to be spread in different parts of the world. Anything, anything that is different than this, in t burn it. Burn it. <laughs> that was his, he, was, he gave an order. And so anything that remains, that is outside, that's why he even burnt the one of, of the, the one of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, because it had the seven dialects in it. And he didn't want any potential thing that could go wrong. He just wanted this to be the reference, and everybody is sticking to this. This is the standard by which we continue from now on. And subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed. Ali ibn Abi Talib, later on, he said, if I lived, and I was to choose any other path to do anything, I wouldn't have chosen anything but the one that uh, Uthman ibn Affan chose. Because it was the right thing, to, given the condition of how you know, new Muslims that are coming in all the different situations that are, that are there. The Quran, as it was revealed at that time, you know, there, were, there were no dots on it. There were, you know, there were no harakat. This Fatha Kasra thing it was not there. The dots were not. So it was just, you know, just these words. You would see something like.